Ladies and gentlemen, this is your reaction. This is when horror movies become real life. Nope. By the channel Casual Geographic. I guess the movie. Nope. All right. I didn't watch the movie, so I don't know what the uh, you know story is going to be. But yeah, this is Casual Geographic, so it's going to be horrendous. Yeah, this channel 99% of the time just <laughs> it just shows something that is really dark. I guess it has its own charm because yeah, it's always fun to watch these videos, right? He just basically spews out facts. But he does it in a way that's really entertaining. I can't really put my finger on like, uh, you know, does he create a script or does he just say things that comes to his mind? I don't, I don't know how he makes this video, but yeah, this was it. So I watched Nope and by far the scariest scene was actually the most realistic. Obviously spoilers ahead, so if you haven't watched it, save this video and then come back when you do. So for me, him. the most chilling scene in the entire movie was the Gordy scene. Basically, there was a TV show revolving around a family adopting a chimpanzee. Except one day, in front of a live studio audience, Gordy went on a rampage, violently murking two actors and severely maiming a young girl. And I do think it was a reference to the 2009 Travis the Chimp attack. Travis was a pet chimpanzee. Two words that have no business being in the same sentence. He was adopted by Sandra and Jerome Harold, and he was basically a celebrity in that community. He was known by everyone, appeared on TV, and he even took pictures with members of the police department, which is actually going to be really important later. Travis would sleep in bed with her and her husband and would even take baths with them. No comment on that. Travis could open doors with keys, he knew how to watch TV, bro could drive, and he would even drink wine with his owners. To the point where Sandra said this, and I don't think anything has ever aged worse. And it's not like Travis didn't have incidents where people saw what he was capable of. One time he bit someone so hard that it drew blood and they had to go get a rabies shot, but when that person filed a police report, it was never investigated. Huh, I wonder why. Another time, Travis was in a car when someone threw a bottle at him, causing him to hold up traffic for hours and evade cops as he attempted to get his lick back. But nothing ever happened and nobody did anything because they claimed Travis was only playing. Huh, I wonder why. However, after that, Sandra decided to keep Travis inside at all times. And after her husband passed and her mental health declined, so did her ability to care for Travis. So now Travis was stuck inside, overweight from eating nothing but junk food, depressed and never able to socialize with his own kind, and bro was very much maidenless. Oh, and he was on Xanax. Yeah, at that point Travis was just a landmine with a pulse and in 2009 it finally exploded. While helping her friend lure Travis back inside, Charlotte Nass held up his Tickle Me Elmo to get his attention. Travis charged and proceeded to horrifically maul her. Travis brutally mutilated the woman, even after getting hit in the head with a shovel and stabbed in the back with a butcher knife. Eventually, Travis was put down and Charlotte Nass survived. But her face and hand had literally been torn off. It was so bad that first responders and cops needed therapy after witnessing the carnage. And Nope actually referenced her as a disfigured child star is seen wearing a veil. The same kind Charlotte would wear after the attack. Not to mention Gordy and Travis died in the exact same way. And in both cases, a wild animal is treated as a commodity and exploited. The result traumatized everyone involved. But at the end of the day, Travis was the biggest victim in all this along with Charlotte Nash. He should have been living his best life in the jungle as a wild animal. Instead, he was drinking wine and taking Xanax as someone's flex. So if you're ever rewatching this movie, keep in mind that this actually... What the fuck, man? That whole story. I mean... Uh... Facts about the Travis Chimp incident. Basically stuff oh, as a motto. Yeah. Holy shit, this whole story is fucked up. Uh, you know, uh, people do weird shit, right? I'm not surprised by that, but actually overlooking things that were happening, it's like, uh, you have a pet that is unusual, like, uh, you know, this could be dangerous, and on top of that, you see his aggressive behavior, and like, ah, he's just, he's just being him, and just police and everybody just, you know, just basically letting that go, like, that's not human, that's chimpanzee, what the fuck are you doing? If you see signs that this could be a problematic, you do something about it. Right, having a, some volatile uh, pet, the first thing you do is make sure everything's hundred percent. If anything sees off, you need to you know take care of that somehow. Like you know, have him looked up, you know, looked out for. The, does he do more of that volatile shit? You know, have a doctor, che you know, che basically see, uh, you know, che check him medically or whatever. And in the end, if you still don't feel right, let him go. It's uh, yeah, you know, him being aggressive, people letting you know that off. Like yeah, it's just fine. Yeah, that was about to go off, right? This was really fucked up, and yeah, he, he's a he's a wild animal, man. If you're gonna chain him, chain him in the house, not let it. If you look at people, what happened to them in COVID? They, they were you know they were under lockdown, and lots of people literally developed this kind of a psychological symptoms. Like if I don't go out of this house, I'm gonna go crazy. That kind of mentality, and that's a wild animal, right? That's a, if if you can't you know survive that, how the fuck a wild animal is gonna survive that, right? And Xanax, right? 
So this uh, this is just fucked up scenario all around. I left out in the first video that I figured would be important to know. After the first incident where Travis held up traffic for hours, Connecticut actually ended up passing a law where you couldn't own a primate heavier than 50 pounds. By the time of the attack, he was pushing past 200. But the law didn't apply to Travis because people assumed that the Heralds had him for so long that he was considered not to be a public threat. Sandra Harold was really? actually warned by an animal control officer that once Travis reached maturity, he'd be more prone to violent and aggressive tendencies, like male chimps in the wild. Especially since he wouldn't have an outlet for certain urges he would get once he became mature. But obviously, Sandra didn't listen. Now, a lot of people blame Sandra for the event. And I'm one of them. But I think it is worth mentioning that in 2000, her only daughter tragically passed in a car accident. Causing her to literally see and treat Travis as a child since she had lost her only one. Damn. And when her husband died a couple years later, Travis was literally all she had. Not justifying it at all, but, you know, it's complicated. Yeah. Travis was also visibly depressed at the loss of his adoptive I mean, look, people need to understand, like, uh, psychological uh, effects can vary a lot, right? So, a tragedy like that, I mean, your mental state at that point, like, you know, if you if your just mind's are set up, like, you know, if you start to see this chimpanzee as your kid, by that point, she's just going to, you know, uh, defend that uh, chimpanzee like it's one of uh, her kids. She's not going to see any difference, right? So, she's going to make sure nobody does anything, nobody takes the chimpanzee away. She's not going to let chimpanzee out of the house or listen to any other uh, arguments, right? Because at that point, that's, uh, the chimpanzee is her, you know, I guess... Uh, so Whatever, son, daughter, whatever. Yeah. So that's this fucked up scenario. Father. After his death, Travis would apparently take pictures of Jerome Harold off the wall and hold them tightly, clearly mourning. According to reports, Travis had been prescribed Xanax by a vet to help him calm down. He was even given Xanax laced tea the day of the attack. Xanax is often used to help treat anxiety, but it can also cause hallucination, rage, and mania. After mm. horrifically mauling Charlotte Nash, Travis was shot four times. Mortally wounded, Travis went back to the house and passed away right next to his cage, which you have to assume was his safe space. On a wholesome note, Charlotte Nash actually ended up undergoing a face transplant and actually seems to be doing a lot better these days. And according to her, she's no longer in pain and doesn't even seem to really remember the attack, just what people tell her about it. And honestly, it's probably better that way. Despite all she's been through, she's still managing to stay positive. Also, after the police officer who put down Travis was denied therapy, laws were passed to make sure cops that had to use lethal force on an animal could receive therapy for mental and emotional recovery. On this episode of why no human should ever try to own a chimp is a story that, if I'm being honest, kind of messed me up the first time I heard it. Yeah, yeah, more than Travis. Former NASCAR driver St. James Davis and his wife LaDonna had a chimp they had adopted from Tanzania named Mo. And before you say it, no, nah, this story isn't going in the direction you think it is. The couple treated Mo like he was their son, dressing him up, bathing him, and they even taught him how to use the toilet. Mo was even the best man at their wedding. But after an incident in 1998 where Mo attacked and bit an officer, the couple were forced to give up Mo to a wildlife rescue center in California. But they loved him and this didn't stop them from visiting Mo regularly. One day in 2005, the couple were celebrating Mo's 39th birthday and even brought him his own cake. So um, important fact about chimps. Chimpanzee society works as a hierarchy, where low ranks are often bullied and forced to give up food to their superiors who get first service. Damn. That structure is actually why baboons have become a real problem in parts of South Africa. You see, they tell you not to feed the baboons because when you do, not only are the baboons associating people with food, which is bad, it also means they start seeing all humans as low ranks and start expecting food, which is worse. This would be important for two reasons. Reason number one, two other chimps saw the couple give Mo the birthday cake. Reason number two, that was a really bad time for those two chimps to escape. The two chimps violently confronted them and one of them bit off LaDonna's thumb. And to protect his wife, St. James Davis put himself between his wife and the chimps. What followed was, without exaggeration, one of the most horrifically brutal attacks I've ever read about. The two chimps mauled and mutilated the man, and if you read about exactly how they did it, it didn't seem like the chimps were trying to end him. It seemed like they were actively trying to torture him. One chimp chewed his finger off while another gouged his eye out. In what seems like a common chimp move, they essentially tore most of his face off. They even went as far as to chew off his genitals and a good chunk of his rear end. Which is another thing chimps are infamous for. They basically did everything but murk him. Keep in mind, this was all over a birthday cake. And at this point, you might be wondering where Mo was when this was all going down. As a chimp that grew up around nothing but humans, the event terrified him so much that he appeared paralyzed. Eventually, a couple workers put the chimps down, but by the time they did, the damage was already done. Former high school football player and NASCAR driver James Davis had pretty much been torn to shreds. He nearly bled out three times on the way to the hospital, and the first two places wouldn't even take him. Someone even said they might as well just drop him at the coroner's office. Eventually, he was taken to a trauma center where he'd go on to have about 12 surgeries and would even be medically induced into a coma. Against virtually every force of nature, Davis survived and was discharged six months later. 
the moral of the story is still the same. Davis had spent nearly 30 years of his life living with a chimp, and all it took was bad luck and a birthday cake to nearly flatline him. It just goes to show, chimps are really good at being wild animals, but really bad at being pets. So I watched no- Yeah, this is just a basic- look, first of all, that uh, chimp that lived with them for 30 years went paralyzed seeing the brutality. <sighs> See, here's the fact, if chimpanzees and how they live, their whole life is uh, really fucked up in a way that they are just wild animals, basically. That's, that's what we, when we say, yeah, that, that's a wild animal. It just basically triggers in your, your head, like, what that means, right? But this also shows me, like, if, uh, you know, uh, if chimpanzees condition uh, somehow, I don't know how, but somehow can be, you know, made better, they're not going to be as brutal, right? Because that chimpanzee got paralyzed, uh, the, you know, the, that spent life uh, 30 years uh, with uh, those humans or whatever, right? Uh, but yeah, that chimpanzee basically went paralyzed seeing that because he, he didn't see he didn't you know live with ch other chimpanzees he lived with humans, so for him it was just as devastating as any human it would be for any other human. So whole ch chimpanzee's mentality comes from living brutal life, right? At least uh, you know that's something. But yeah, uh, you are going to pet any wild animal. There is a major issues with that, right? You have to be extremely careful. That's what this story tells us, definitely. The small thing here and there can fuck everything up, right? You can't just, you can't, basically this dog and cats, right? People have this mentality, like, how we behave with dogs and cats, we can do that with any other animal. No, that's not how it works. Open without spoiling too much, it reminded me of something that actually happened. And I'm just gonna put that right there. This is what? Timothy Treadwell. If that name sounds familiar, then you know what time it is. I think it's important to mention he wasn't like a zoologist or an educator or something. He was a dude that auditioned for Cheers and then lost out to Woody Harrelson. That caused him to spiral down the path of things I cannot talk about on here. Let's just say he had his demons and his demons had hands. But he turned his life around after going on a trip to Alaska with a buddy and observing bears up close. He decided right then and there that he'd dedicate his entire life to bears. Yeah. For over a decade he watched, studied, recorded, and even directly interacted with bears. He would get extremely close to them and would sometimes even play with bear cubs because he claimed that he had their trust. And if you watch Nope, you know exactly where this is finna go. Now I will say Treadwell did try to make an impact by traveling all over as an activist trying to educate the public about bears and why they should be protected, but he also threatened their lives by getting way too close. And as time went on, he started getting cocky, which led him to do the unthinkable. So a little fun fact about bears, before they hibernate, they have to eat and put on as much weight as possible. The competition for food makes them a thousand times more aggressive and infinitely more of a death sentence to be around. Against literally everyone's warning, he chose this time to go camping around them. Not only that, but he purposely set up his camp around a known bear trail so that bears would walk right past his tent. Not only that, but he refused to carry bear spray because the Steve Irwin stereotype figure the bears trusted him so much that he'd never need it. Not only that, but he refused to carry bear spray because the Steve Irwin stereotype figure the bears trusted him so much that he'd never need it. And not only that, he brought his girlfriend with him. So pretty much he chose the worst place at a worst time with no way to defend himself. You, you know where it goes from here. On October 5th, 2003, Treadwell spoke to a friend about how much fun he was having. On October 6th, rangers found his and his girlfriend's half-eaten corpses around their campsite. But the most disturbing part? A video camera was actually left on as the grizzly attacked them. Another cute little fact about bears, they don't wait until you flatline, they just start eating. Which meant there was a 6 minute audio recorded of him screaming in agony as he was getting mauled and eaten alive while his girlfriend could only watch. And since she was also screaming, the bear eventually went after her too. The audio was so graphic and traumatizing that it was never released to the public. You can find reenactments based on what happened on YouTube, but the original was vaulted out of respect for the family. Also, the bear that was only guilty of being a bear was tracked down and put out of commission. Obviously, soul eviction by bear is the worst way to meet God, and nobody deserves that. But <laughs> Come on. I don't understand that. So, uh, look, if, uh, like, say, some dog goes rabid, right? So roaming the you know city or something uh, where people walk around. Yeah, you'd go out, go behind the dog and put it, put put him out of misery or whatever. But bears are just bears. Bears are in their habitat. They are not in city or something. So if somebody is gonna go to them thinking that they earn their trust, then bear being bear, uh, you know, basically does something fucked up. Why would you go chase that bear and kill him just out of revenge? Like, justice system does not work based on revenge, right? It works based on common sense. 
Uh, criminals don't get put it behind jail because that's a punishment. No, it's because they're unfit to walk around normal people. So they got jailed. That's why there is such thing as parole and shit like that. So I don't understand that part with the bear. Bears were in their habitat, right? Bears were being bear, right? It was that, you know, hibernating time. Of course, they're going to be violent, right? All bears are going to be like that. I don't know. It's like, you know, fucking uh, draining a river because it drowns somebody, like... Bro literally asked for it, and it all could have been avoided with one word. Nope. Yeah, shout out to this comment, because I honestly don't know how I didn't talk about them already. So Siegfried and Roy were two German entertainers who blew up from their magic act. They were basically the magic what the Beatles were to rock. And their act often involved exotic animals, but especially big cats like tigers. You probably know how this movie ends. For years, the two became world famous for their performances, and especially for the ways that incorporate the wild animals. And you'd get the sense that they genuinely cared for all of their animals especially Roy, who had been around wild exotic animals since he was 10. And it was during a show on Roy's birthday that he performed his usual act with Montecore, a 400-pound white tiger. But this time, the tiger wasn't cooperating and was instead biting Roy's sleeve while ignoring his commands. And it was while animal trainers attempted to get Montecore under control that it finally happened. In front of a horrified audience, Montecore severely mauled the leading co-star, clamping his jaws around his neck and eventually dragging him off stage. It took animal trainers spraying him with a fire extinguisher to get the tiger to release his death grip. Roy would survive, but the attack severed his spine, cut an artery, partially paralyzed him, and even caused a stroke, virtually cutting both men's careers short. Roy refused to blame his tiger for the attack, famously telling trainers not to hurt Montecore as he was being wheeled to the hospital for life-saving surgery. Surgery that he allegedly flatlined multiple times during. Damn. Later, Roy claimed that the attack was actually the tiger trying to save his life. Roy said he was already suffering a stroke and Montscore sensed it and attempted to drag him to safety, the same way a mother would do to her cub. However, the animal trainer that actually worked with them had a very different story. Trainer Chris Lawrence would come out and say that the real reason for the attack was that Roy's relationship with the huge cat had deteriorated. And when Roy started going off script and doing things they hadn't practiced, that's when the tiger went, you thought I was going to say crazy? Nah, the, the tiger tigered. The trainer would also say that Roy had made several crucial mistakes handling Montecore and lied about what happened to protect the show, their brand, and himself. Roy basically called him a clout chaser. And I want to add just for the record, there was literally nothing protecting the audience from the tigers. I mean, yeah, they were on a leash, but we're talking about an animal that solos <laughs> that for a living. Your leash means nothing. But I guess after several years of performing- It's a fucking tiger. Tigers are top of the food chain. They're the biggest muscular cat that is, right? I mean, tiger is tiger, for fuck's sake. But yeah, holy, I mean, you know, he cared about the uh, tiger so much that he's nearly dying and he only thing can remember, like, don't hurt, don't hurt the tiger or whatever. At least that's that. I mean, Roy and Siegfried figured they had complete control over the big cats. No spoilers, but major nope vibes. But yeah, long story short, wild animal went wild animal. But why am I bringing this up? Well, a couple reasons. The largest population of tigers in the world is in India. You want to take a guess where number two is? Texas. In fact, this was in Houston. There are more... <laughs> of course. <laughs> number two is in Texas. Yeah. yeah. Lots of shit happens in India. But yeah, people realize a tiger is a fucking tiger. Right? So they're going to be careful. Nobody's going to like, oh, look at that. I have a man son. I'm going to have a pet tiger with me. Yeah, no. More tigers in America than found in the wild in the rest of the world. You remember that weird phase when people would use tiger selfies as Tinder profiles? I genuinely hope none of you got laid. And if you had Netflix during the <laughs> pandemic, you already know about Joe Exotic. My point is people have had a hard on for exploiting tigers for as long as we've known about them. And fans aren't going to want to hear this, but this was just another example of that. I will give- <laughs> Having a tiger selfie is the same thing as having a, a Hummer with you and having a selfie. Like, that's not giving good vibes, man, right? Nobody's going to say, oh, look at that, he's manly, no. Give them credit for two things, though. This might be the first story like this where the animal wasn't eventually unalived for being an animal. And number two, it really did feel like they genuinely cared for their animals. I say that because if a 400 pound killing machine really wanted Roy to be a hashtag, his chalk outline would have been on that very stage. But when you take a wild animal and turn it into a side act, it's only a matter of time because one thing about a tiger, a tiger gone tiger. Yeah. And ultimately all the attack was was a tiger tigering. And just like that, I think I just gave you the entire plot of Nope without actually spoiling it. Moral of this story, well there's actually two. Putting a leash on a tiger is like putting a traffic cone in front of a runway 18 wheeler and telling kids it's safe to cross. Yeah, when I see Tiger, I see that one of those movies, like what is that Denzel Washington movies, right? Where he's like, I've been an assassin for 30 years, now retire, but for you, I'm going to make an exception. And <laughs> that's what Tiger is, basically. Yeah, I'm performing, but I'm fucking Tiger, right? I'm more everything that moves. 
And if you really love a tiger, the best thing you can do for it is let it be a tiger. Yeah. At this point, we're all very much familiar with the Travis Chimp attack of 09. But there's a whole nother part of the story that way less people know about. Chimp Party used to be a business that was run by two people in Missouri. The business being renting out chimpanzees for parties, TV ads, movies, stuff like that. Yeah, at this point, I don't think I even have to say it. Take a shot for every bad decision you've heard in this video. If you're still alive by the end, you just weren't paying attention. Anyway, in 2001, three chimpanzees escaped from Chimp Party and wandered down the road. And by escaped, I mean they walked through an unlocked door. The chimps eventually ran into an 18-year-old Jason Coates and a couple of his friends. Chimp activity followed. The three chimps charged at the teens who were chased into their car. And it was at this point where one of the chimps named Susie noticed Jason's dog and went after him. Jason did what any respectable dog father would do. Jason managed to escape into his house while his friends and dog were still in danger and returned with a shotgun. Now what happened next depends on who you ask. Some say Jason put down Susie after she had already been tranquilized and was no longer a threat. Jason said his friends and dog were still being attacked when he ultimately pulled the trigger. The price of defending his loved ones was that Jason was charged with misdemeanor animal abuse and the 18 year old even served 30 days in jail. He was even hit with felony destruction of private property. The private property being the chimp that threatened his life. And while serving his time, Jason actually ended up missing the birth of his first child. Chimp Party, which later became the Missouri Chimp Foundation, ended up being forced to give away their chimps in 2020 and 2021 after PETA claimed that So a habit had fucked up, uh, kept the door open. In a basically, uh, you know, uh, any what was a town, city, whatever that was, and where an wild animals attack certain people, person defended, and that somehow got charged. Sometimes this is like, do these prosecutors even process like what the fuck is happening? Those are chimps, not do you know domestic dogs that were going after these people, right? And he defended himself. In America, a, a, a person can walk up to your, you know, so your private property. Right, and you can have a right to shoot him in defense, but you can shoot a chimp, a wild chimp that was basically threatening you. The apes were being held in poor, unsanitary conditions. You know, it takes a lot for me to side with Peter. I'd say this was a lot, but why am I telling you this story from 20 years ago? Well, Susie, the chimp that got gunned down, yeah, that was Travis's mother. Travis had already been sold by the breeders and was living with the Heralds when it all went down. And eight years later, Travis would meet his end the exact same way as his mother. Only this time, it wasn't before someone got seriously hurt. Moral of this story, it takes a special type of people to make Peter the good guy. <laughs> Damn, okay. Yeah. His mother. Yeah, all right. Damn, so that was... Yeah. The, uh, I knew this video was going to be dark, but not at this level dark. Holy shit. I mean, when uh, Casual Geographic puts horror in the title, you should expect a bit more, I guess. But yeah, there you go. So, yeah. <sighs> Some fucked up stories that I think I could have lived my life without hearing that, but fine, I guess. It was fine. Yeah. It, it definitely teaches you things. Uh, the things that I already knew, but I guess people will at least learn that wild animals are fucking wild animals. L leave them be. But yeah. Right, well, that was when horror movies become real life. Nope. By the channel Casual Geographic. If you like my and don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you next time.